Kwahia Tonk, marquer l'imaginaire. Kwahia Tonk and its partners are proud to present the literary podcast of the Book Fair. Today, episode 5, Feminism, hosted by Rachel McCrum. I am a woman. I am a Northern Ireland-born woman, now residing in Montreal or Jujage. I'm a white, feminist, settler, immigrant poet, trying to understand the experience of indigenous women in the country I have chosen to live in. In my quest, I conducted remote interviews with three indigenous female writers, Ni Marigal, Leanne Betisimoke Simpson and Marie Anhart Baker, who have written widely about the experiences of indigenous women, about concepts of indigenous feminism, and where those concepts intersect with decolonialization, heteropatriarchy, fiction and storytelling from female, non-binary and LGBTQ Indigenous writers today. I wanted to ask them for their reflections on the relationship between the lived experiences of Indigenous women and what I had seen referred to as Indigenous feminism. But first, why ask Indigenous female authors? Indigenous men will write about what happened to us and what uh, Canadians did to us. And that makes them very popular because let's face it, Canadians like to read about themselves. And um, women writers, though, will write about us and who we are and how we get past what we've become. And it, it's a what, not a who. We aren't who we are right now. Uh, we've become... Uh, squeezed between a rock and a hard place and we we have to move beyond that and become who we are and will always want to be so the women writers are doing that they're they're walking us home as we call it in our in our language as we say it's a long walk home from this world to ours you've just heard from stolo writer lee maracle talking about the differences between indigenous male and female writers as she sees it in the 1990s, Maracle also said, I am not interested in gaining entry to the doors of the white women's movement. I would look just a little ridiculous sitting in their living room saying we this and we that. So what is indigenous feminism and how does it differ from the white woman's movement? First, I spoke with Anishinaabe storyteller, poet, essayist and playwright Marie Anhart Baker, also known as AKA, also known as Anhart. She's the author of four poetry collections and won the inaugural Blue Metropolis First Peoples Literary Prize in 2015. I love her work for its dexterity and wit, for the wry and unabashed explorations of female identities in her books Indigena Arai and Exercises in Lip Pointing. She has spoken widely of how her creative work not only builds on, but actively reconstructs relationships with her female relatives. I felt I was connecting to my mom, my grandmother, an ancestral woman mind. As I read more women writers, a lot of them expressed this same view, that there was a mother line for a woman writer. She moved back to the Little Saskatchewan Reserve, 200 kilometres north of Manitoba, just over two years ago. I asked her what had inspired the move. It turned out to be a book by Louise Erdrich. I mm -hmm. think it's one of her first books, but um, I sort of um, have an inspiration there was uh, she has like a lead female character, but um, that woman's mother um, died um, in like a snowstorm, you know, getting lost sort of like maybe she was trying to come home even though she was out in a snowstorm. So when her daughter comes to the reserve or reservation as they call it down there, um, she is bringing back the memory of her mother. So that's what I feel. 
I feel like I was inspired uh, by that as well. So it's like I'm, by my coming here, I'm uh, sort of bringing back my mother. I asked her, did you grow up on the reserve? Was this a homecoming for you? No, but um, again, my mother married a non-native, so that meant she lost her status. And so all we could do when I was younger was visit. She couldn't live on the reserve again, you know, because of the Indian Act. It took away her status and that, but uh, I got status back in um, 1985, you know, so I could be a member of the community. But um, like I said, with, uh, you know, my mother, uh, it's like I'm bringing her home, her spirit home, by my coming back. I mean, by my um, coming to live here. In Canada, the Indian Act of 1876 decreed that Indigenous women who married non-Indian men would lose their status rights, as would their children. This loss of status, enforced by the Indian agent, meant that these women could no longer live or participate in their communities, either in traditional Indigenous governance structures nor in the new system of band councils. The effect was a state-sponsored disenfranchisement of Indigenous women, separating them from the support of their community. In 1985, Following campaigning by Indigenous women, the Indian Act was amended under Bill C-31 to allow women who married out or lost their status by other means to apply for restoration for themselves and for their children. I asked Anne Hart if her mother had also been able to regain her status in 1985. That's another part is my mother is one of the murdered and missing women. Yeah, so I lost her when I was about nine. That's what my current um, writing efforts are towards trying to, uh, I guess, work that in. Because uh, a lot of my writing has been, you know, was based on a lot of, uh, you know, personal journal writing. Um, you know, trying to get at the inside of myself. Because, again, really never had that much opportunity to share that. And uh, as it turned out, I... I couldn't really even do that in some of these counseling sessions I went to and that. So I finally found the way through writing to be able to sort of rebuild my inner self. It is impossible to know fully how many make up the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls of Canada. Indigenous women make up just over 4% of the population of Canada, but 16% of all female homicide victims, and over 11% of all missing women. In 2015, the Government of Canada began a public truth-gathering process and national inquiry. The inquiry was deemed closed and concluded in June 2019. For Anne Hart, it feels as if the official inquiry has not told the full story. Oh, I think so. I think so. Like in uh, my present community here, uh, I, I don't uh, find that uh, people speak or know that much about the women that have gone missing here. And even my mother is uh, like kind of like an exception to that. So... In some of these communities, that's, um, you know, people that are, like, forgotten to their families and, and to the history of the, of the community. And Hart's work continues in that spirit. But there are more stories to be told, including that of her mother, and more work to be done. I asked Anne Hart for her thoughts on feminist movements and Indigenous women. I go back to thinking there was a time in our indigenous community, I don't know about the other ones, 
but I know in Anishinaabe, I really felt there was more of a balance between the genders. So that's kind of what uh, I believe was in the past. And the reason I believe that is because um, women were important um, providers of food, not just in the preparation, but we actually grew like uh, food. Uh, maybe we didn't hunt as much, but we were providing a lot of the, the basics there. And um, I guess looking after, you know, um, the actual maybe construction of the house and that, you know, whatever home we had, wigwam or teepee. So we were, um, you know, dominant in that. Mm. And, uh, you know, it, whereas, you know, the 50s image of the housewife, well, that uh, didn't affect us uh, until uh, the more Christian thinking had come into the community. And uh, women were pretty well expected to stay at home, like not have a job and that kind of thing. So I guess I would um, think of uh, feminism as more, um, you know, agreeing to be part of a class system that is still uh, basically privileging non-Native women. Mm -hmm. So when you join that, you're just, uh, you know, a kind of... Uh, it's a tiny bit of uh, that uh, movement. You barely get any kind of recognition, except maybe at times for being female. So I guess I kind of feel that uh, we're very marginal to the feminist. Uh, it's called a movement. I guess that's, you know, that is benefited. But again, mostly on a class basis, it seems to me that... Uh, I mean, it's good that women, uh, you know, got better work or, you know, better positions than that. I think that that's good. But I don't think there was enough uh, freedom there for them sometimes to create uh, career paths for other women. In a way, I think it's still, we're still on hold about that. The child welfare system really pitted non-Native uh, social workers again against our people, essentially taking Indigenous children away from their families and putting them in the care of non-Native uh, uh, parents. And those parents um, were given uh, money to raise those children, um, whereas uh, Indigenous families were not supported um, you know, financially to keep their children. So uh, again, that was a huge uh, discrepancy and women against women was uh, often the, uh, you know, main uh, problem there. In both Anne Hart's experiences in writing, there's a clear through line from the disenfranchisement of Indigenous women under the Indian Act to the isolation and loss of support that comes from the removal of community connection. If Indigenous women and their families are made reliant on a state that is little interest in providing for them, vulnerability follows. Western feminism has failed to acknowledge these circumstances, the intersectionality of these contexts. I turn to a conversation with Lee Maracle. In 1996, Maracle wrote, I sometimes feel like a foolish young grandmother, armed with three teaspoons, determined to move the three mountains on the path to liberation. The mountain of sexism, the mountain of racism, the mountain of nationalist oppression. So I wondered, how are the mountains looking these days? I have a tablespoon now. <laughs> Lee Maracle of Salish and Cree ancestry is a member of the Stolo Nation. She is an award-winning poet, novelist, performance storyteller, scriptwriter, actor, and keeper mythmaker among the Stolo people, mother of four and the grandmother of four. She was one of the first Indigenous people to be published in the early 1970s, and her 1988 book I Am Woman is cited as a key text on racism and feminism in Canada. 
I asked her to tell me more about gender roles in Indigenous communities. The territory belongs to the women of the village who, live, who have lived there from time immemorial and their descendants. So you you come from a village that I come from. So with you, that's where my wealth comes from. That's where my uh, authority comes from. So if I move to another village, I don't have any authority there. Mm-hmm. The women who are there have authority. Like I lived in uh, the Okanagan for some time, three years I think, and I had to seek permission from the Armstrongs to get to go berry picking. They always gave it to me, but it puts you in a lesser position. You can't just go up the mountain and pick berries. It's not yours. <laughs> it belongs to these women here. <laughs> and they will figure out how much they need, and they'll tell you how much you can pick. Because they also know how many berries there are. Right yeah. there. <laughs> and some has to be left for the bears. <laughs> so, you know, just everybody has to take a share here. <laughs> So they manage it that way. Mm-hmm. Not that they're stingy or anything like that. It's just there's so many berries, so many people, so many bears, and you're third on the list to get something because you're not from here. You could easily go home and get your berries, but you know it's not that easy if it's 300 miles. Now girls uh, weren't allowed to stay if they married out. And that had to do with more with the Indian agent than the community. Nowadays, we stay. And of course, nobody loses uh, their, their status in terms of a status card. But not all communities forced us out. It was mainly the Indian agent that forced us out. It was the state. So that made it difficult and it made it essential for us to have control over our own citizenship. So that's what we're struggling for now. We still haven't got control of our citizenship yet, but we are hoping to get that back because at one time we did have control. That didn't change till almost 30 years after Confederation. And then they changed it all. And of course that made it difficult for us to, um, uh, function because the women are the ones with the positions that's what we get our power from our village not from someone somewhere else in a 2014 paper from the University of Saskatchewan Victoria Cowan argues that the multi-generic nature of Lee Maracle and Mohawk writer Beth Brandt's work constitutes it as Indigenous feminist theory. Does Maracle agree with this? Yeah, I think so too. And I, and I think that, that people don't often fear, think of us as fear, theorists, but we are. And I think, you know, Betta Masoki fits up there and I think Marilyn Dumont fits in that too in that category as well as Beth Brandt and myself and if Connie Fife was still alive I'd call her a theorist as well there there's quite a number of indigenous female theorists um, out there that aren't considered theorists by western uh, feminists because they have a narrow per, uh, purview or, or perception of what feminism is if you're not seeking equality with men then you're not a feminist i'm saying why would you shoot so low you know shoot higher aim higher um i I think somebody said it to me oh people who think equality is the struggle have no ambition (laughs) i gotta think that's true shoot higher I love this, even where I'm not yet fully sure what it means. In I Am Woman, Maracle states, liberation is not simple. Refeminizing our original being is not a matter of gaining equality with native men. Sharing the work of providing for family, obtaining decent jobs and education, moving out into the world and struggling to make the law work fairly for us. First, we must understand the conditions under which we currently live. 
understanding these conditions and committing to changing them requires us to understand not only the gender relationships, but also the economic, social and spiritual ways in which we live. Our theory takes you into connection with the earth, the sky, the waters, the animals the, and the human beings and brings the one percenters down to where everybody else is. That doesn't mean we're going to do better than we're currently doing. It means we're going to live better. And that's where we're going with all this. We need to live well. In fact, health to all of us translates as being alive well. Not just being alive, but doing it well. And doing it well is emotional, spiritual, physical, and mental. And so if you read our works, it's throughout our text. If you, I mean, I think particularly Leanne Simpson is clear about that. I think she's the clearest of us all. Um, she's younger and she did her PhD on oral story. And I think that she had that opportunity. She was probably the first one that did that. I think it's amazing that uh, she did. And her elders were so helpful to her in understanding story and its relation to being alive well. So now we have that as a text that's a theoretical text that articulates for us who we are and where we're going and how we're going to get there. So to Leanne Betasimoke Simpson. Leanne Betasimoke Simpson is a renowned Mishi Sagig Nishnebeg scholar, writer and artist. Her work breaks open the intersections between politics, story and song, bringing audiences into a rich and layered world of sound, light and softened creativity. Working for two decades as an independent scholar using Nishnebeg intellectual practices, Simpson has lectured and taught extensively at universities across Canada and the United States and has 20 years' experience with Indigenous land-based education. Her new novel, Nupaming, The Cure for White Ladies, is published with House of Anansi Press in the fall of 2020. Simpson's academic and writing practices explore systemic oppressions of Indigenous peoples under colonialism, stretching wider than a gender binary of male and female. I ask, is feminism a relevant word for you? I think that I feel it's a useful tool because heteropatriarchy is something that has come to the Anishinaabe as part of colonialism and it's something that has penetrated every aspect of life. And so it's not a term or a phrase that I I identify very strongly with, um, but I do think it's, and it doesn't hold a lot of meaning for me, um, but I think that it is a phrase that is useful um, in order to be able to critique and to name um, what's happening to, to different genders within my society and to, um, to sort of think otherwise. I think the, wor the word for me that, that encapsulates it most is colonialism. Um, and I think that the way that colonialism operates is that it's always sort of shifting and it's, um, there's a movement to it. And so I think I'm careful not to ever become too attached to certain phrases in English because of that shifting um, and that, that uh, how entrenched certain ideas can become. What has happened to different genders within your society? Well, colonialism has been a very gendered um, experience, I think, for Indigenous peoples um, in Canada and on Turtle Island. And Anishinaabe society had more than two genders. So we didn't have a gender binary between um, male and female. We had more, there were more options than that. There were more genders than that. Um, and I think this rigidity around what it means 
to be each gender is something that's also been imposed. And it's been imposed by the colonizer in very strategic ways um, as a mechanism to sort of weaken our, our family units and our relationships in order to be able to remove indigenous peoples from the land in order to be able to get the, the resources. So I think for me, it's important to take a step back first from what one normally might think about with the word feminism and indigenous feminism and look at this broad um, spectrum of ideas around gender, around how we relate to the land, around our non-human um, relations like the plant and animal nations, around our responsibilities to um, peoples that we share time and space with that are also dealing with aspects of, of colonialism and Black Lives Matters comes to, to mind and um, sort of building solidarity with um, the Black queer community and, and Black feminists. And so I think that um, this idea of patriarchy and heteropatriarchy has been a tool that colonizers have, have used to set up a sort of hierarchy in our society, um, a hierarchy of oppression and to disrupt those uh, Anishinaabe or indigenous relationships and the relationality, the way that we relate to each other and the way that we relate to the world. And that's caused a tremendous amount of harm. Um, and that causes a tremendous amount of harm um, so I think that we need to look at it quite broadly and look at the impact of and the violence that has been put upon the queer community within Indigenous nations, um, the ways that Indigenous masculinity has been shrunk and, and uh, defined in, in such a rigid way, um, the gender binary, the hierarchy, um, all of the ways that uh, our relationships have been disrupted um, and all of the ways that we now, if we're not careful and if we're not um, thinking, uh, it's easy to replicate uh, these kinds of oppressions in our own families, in our own communities. Has feminist writing been useful to you? It hasn't been useful to me. But what has been useful is, um, is black feminist thought. I think that's been a really, really useful um, tool for me because it's, there's such a large body of literature. And as a, as a young indigenous person, I had Lee Miracles, I Am Woman, which was an amazing uh, gift. Um, and then I had a lot of black feminists that were writing, um, like Angela Davis and Bell Hooks. And I think at the time they were taking on anti-blackness. Um, they were centering queerness. They were, they were taking a broader approach than, than white mainstream feminists. And I think that that, um, for me, that has had a tremendous impact on, on my work and my, and my thinking. I reflect back on Lee and Anne Hart's comments about Indigenous writing walking the people's home. For Leanne, what are the female, two-spirit, non-binary and queer Indigenous writers doing today? Oh, I definitely think that they're building new worlds and they're... Um, they're uh, inhabiting those worlds and making decisions in those worlds and pulling, pulling different um, aspects of our society into those worlds. And I think that's one of the things that I've tried to do in my own work, in my own practice, is to um, make visible the worlds that are often hidden um, from, from the mainstream. And so this idea that there's indigenous women and queer folks and, and reserve communities and, and people in the North have been, and our elders and our languages have been building 
these alternative worlds through story, through action, through practice, um, where there's a different way of making decisions, where there's a different set of ethics guiding um, people who are living in those worlds, animal worlds, plant worlds, and they're all operating at the same time, even though we might only see um, the federal government and the provincial government and band councils, there's all this other stuff that's really beautiful and interesting to me and generative to me that's, that's already going on. And so I've always been interested in sort of centering that and amplifying that and thinking about what happens when um, you sort of start to knit those worlds together. And it's been easiest to do that as, as a fiction writer. It's been easier to do that in fiction than it is in, in academic writing. Um, I think Krista Kutcher has a new memoir coming out this fall um, that is a, is a really, really beautiful and moving story. Uh, the work of Lindsay Nixon is someone that I, I think, um, I know that my students, when I have taught that book, have, have uh, just found a lot of power and meaning uh, in their work. Um, Ariel Twist, Joshua Whitehead, um, Billy Ray Belcourt. I think all of this, um, they're sort of writing in cohort with each other. And I know how meaningful that is in the classroom with, um, with young indigenous students. Um, when I, as the instructor, have sort of the responsibility to bringing work to them that they might not have seen before and they might not have access to, um, and, and I want to make sure that that work is meaningful to them. And so I think these, uh, these writers have really made that job for me easy. There is a tangible sense that these three writers and the writers that they admire are at once creating imaginative places for their peoples and a deep remembrance of what they are, individually and collectively. Canada's colonial policies deliberately and systematically set out to undermine the rights of women and their families in Indigenous communities, isolating them from the support structures and traditional positions. In the work of Anne Hart, Lee Maracle, and Leanne Betasimoke Simpson, the call is not for gender equality in an unequal world, but a reminder and a reimagining of the relations and spaces that are shared between all. I leave the last word with Leanne Simpson, reflecting on the much touted current Indigenous Renaissance. In some ways there's a renaissance and in some ways it's it's there's always been a renaissance and it's just been within inside our communities it's just now that it's um other canadians are noticing um why canada is noticing the kind of cultural institutions are noticing um so there's more visibility but i think um storytelling and creative and artistic practice has always played a really, really beautiful and important role in creating spaces within Indigenous communities of joy and of affirmation and of pride. Um, and I think that Anishinaabe culture really encourages everybody to, to tell their own story and to have, have that voice and to figure out ways of being together where you can honor everybody's everybody's story, even though those stories might be quite different. This podcast was brought to you as part of the ninth edition of the First Nations Book Fair, produced by Kwahia Tonk with the financial support of the Canada Council for the Arts, the Government of Canada and the Government of Quebec. The ninth First Nations Book Fair is presented to you by Energex Renewable Energy, the Caisse des Jardins of Wendake and Hydro-Québec. Directed and hosted by Rachel McCrum. Guests, Lee Maricol, Marianne Hart Baker, and Leanne Batasimosak Simpson. Music and editing, Marc Vallée. Coordination, Louis Carl Picard Siwi. Quoi y a donc marqué l'imaginaire?